I'll just let you know if if I look like I uh, came off a red eye and did sleep and came straight here without taking a shower and been teaching for three hours, you would be correct. So uh, it may not be my best day, but I'm doing my best. Um, <clears throat> so long story short, I'm also recording this right now. So you'll be needing this later today and over the weekend to do homework one and two, uh, which we're going to be covering as part of our uh, class here today. So again, just coming up, uh, remember Monday is Labor Day weekend, so no class. But by the time you come back on Wednesday, homework one and two are due 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. Uh, they will be posted probably later tonight, so you start working on them. They will require using Bloomberg in order to complete the homework. We'll cover some of that in class today. And also next Wednesday, we will start forming groups. <clears throat> so that the way to work is that you either come and say, hey, the four of us want to be on a group, and I'll put you on a group, or you're just going to be randomly assigned to groups. But by the end of class on Wednesday, you'll be in groups. The Bloomberg Trading Challenge will start. And... <clears throat> Um, the following week is the first group project assignment. So the groups have to be done by next Wednesday. And so again, groups given class sizes, probably six to seven people is going to be the, the team size. That so we're going to have probably six or seven teams depending on the section. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So where we left off on Monday is we talked about uh, the four cornerstones. So as a quick refresh, it was spread. It was... Um, so the projector just went out. It was spread, it was cash flow, it was expectation, and it is sustainability. Those were what we defined as the four cornerstones. So the math behind this is what McKinsey and the book that you've been reading calls the key value drivers. So this is just kind of a graphical representation of all of the math. And so in this case, at a high level, three things drive value. The difference between your ROIC and your WAC, your spread. Number two, what that growth is over time, right? And number three, sustainability, which means how long before that ROIC regresses to the mean and how long before that growth slows down as you mature. So essentially the four cornerstones come from the math that's exhibited by the key value drivers. The other driver is what drives ROIC. And ROIC is a function of margin times productivity or efficiency. And so those are what we're going to call the key value drivers that we're going to be using throughout the semester. We also mentioned on Monday the way Warren Buffett does his investment. And I basically gave you a data point that about half the performance of a company is the industry that it's in. So one of the secrets to success of Warren Buffett long term is he generally doesn't invest in companies, he starts with the industry. Because again, if I have an attractive industry, I'm more likely to do well than if I have an unattractive industry, and that's over time. Once I've invested in an attractive industry, then I pick the companies that I think are going to win that have competitive advantage. That's worked for him, and that's a very important perspective to have as we start thinking about analyzing companies as well. So, the other new concept that I'd like to get to today is this. And this is actually based on something that happened in the real world. I was actually working with Company A, and I was dealing with their CFO. And so, basically, these two companies are actually real-world competitors. They sell pretty much similar products. They basically <coughs> have similar growth rates, same profit margins of 8%, <coughs> same cost of capital, same risk profiles, and so the CFO said, <clears throat> everything that I just said, the comments, the analysts agree with, yet they like my competitor better than me. Like, they're pretty, pretty much getting a buy and I'm getting a hold. This doesn't make sense. Like, if I have the same profits, <clears throat> same growth, same risk, same products, same margins, why wouldn't I have the same stock price? And I said, well, <clears throat> what's your productivity? What's your financial cycle time? And he said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, how long does it take you to turn a dollar of investment, invested capital, into a dollar of collected revenue? He said, not really sure. I said, well, great news is here's the formula. It's at the bottom of this page. We can look at your balance sheet, and we can quickly answer that question. So if you take a company's invested capital, point in time, <clears throat> primarily working capital, net PP&E, and you divide it by annual sales or revenue, 12 months worth of sales, 
it gives you the percentage of a year that it takes to sell that investment. Okay? If you then multiply by 365 days, 365.25, you want to be really granular, basically you get days to sell the investment or from the time I spend a dollar to the time I get it back in collected revenue. That is what we'll call the cycle time or productivity of a company. So let's apply it to this example. <clears throat> so both companies make eight cents of profit when they sell their product or service. But company A takes 267 days to get the eight cents and company B takes 135 days to make eight cents. For a dollar of investment, who would you prefer, A or B? A. Everybody agree that B is better? And that's the point. See, we have a bias towards profitability, but profitability is only half the equation. It's not just how much, it's how often or how long, right? So let's just play this out. So A and B start building their products at the same time. On day 135, how much cash profit does A have? Zero. Right? So what's the number? Cash profit, day 135, business A. Okay, you're an accounting major. Oh, sound like one. Okay, so four cents would be the incorrect accounting answer. It's actually zero. And here's why I say that. Because the whole point of the cash cycle, the productivity, is how long it takes to get the cash back. 135 days later, percentage of completion, you're halfway done, four cents. So that's the accounting side. That's what I talked about with the cornerstones about the difference between cash and accounting. Eventually it'll be eight cents, but I'm telling you, if somebody wrote down four cents in a piece of paper and day 135 at company A, you go look for that four cents of cash, you're not going to find it. It's tied up. Okay? So that's why we focus on cash flow. So the answer is actually zero. Okay? Cash profit company B, day 135. Company B, day 135. How much cash profit? It's actually eight cents. Cash profit company A, day 267. Eight cents. Cash profit, company B, day 270. See the advantage? Even though they make the same profit, B will make it twice in the same amount of time. Productivity. That's what productivity is all about. Don't underestimate how powerful that is to valuation. Right? Yes, sir. Well, that's the point, is I, I want to look at the combination of profit and days together. You look at like annualized well, that's where I go. So how do I make those comparisons? I annualize the data, just for comparative purposes. So you're exactly right where we were going. So if I make $0.08 cents every 267 days, what would that be on an annualized basis, on a 365-day basis, approximately? About 11 Okay. And what's eight cents every 135 on an annualized basis? About 22. So if I looked at these two companies, would I rather make for a dollar of investment 11 cents a year or 22 cents a year? 22 sounds better to me. That's how we do it. By the way, what is that annualized number, the 11 and 22, called? ROIC. ROIC, return invested capital. The cash you generate per dollar of, uh, annually per dollar of investment is a function of your margin, how much, times the productivity or efficiency, how often. And that's why ROIC is better than just profit because it includes the cadence of the timing. Okay? So <clears throat> the real challenge that Company A was having in the real world is that basically they had double the balance sheet to have the same amount of sales. That was their basic problem. So if you think about it in the context of this class, take those two rows of students. Take this row of students. This one row of students can do the same amount of work as those two rows of students. That's what you're saying. I need double the investment to get the same output. Or if they only had one row and you had one row, you'd produce two of them every time they produce one. 
One of those two things is going to happen, but mathematically, I'm going to condense it to say I'm more efficient. And so that's the point. Return on investment basically puts together the profitability and the balance sheet efficiency to figure out your overall cash flow. And that's why ROIC is such an important metric because that's what ROIC actually represents. And those are the two drivers of ROIC. Okay, questions? Yes? Your client didn't know that the other she had a 98% of my clients don't know that. That's why they're my clients. And I'm telling you, and, and you can laugh, but these are people that go through most of the business schools. So what I'm telling you is I'm giving you insight in this class that you don't get in business school, you don't get in the real world, because people teach you the income statement. And it's just we're in an income statement biased world. And people forget about the balance sheet. And the balance sheet matters. Right? And, and that's the point. You gotta think about both. I'm not saying the income statement's not important, but there's a balance sheet that goes along with that. Return on investment. What do people focus on? Margin. Well, it's half the equation. You're leaving out half the equation. But that's the way you were taught up until this class. And by the way, that is McKinsey's approach and differentiator in the marketplace. So I'm kind of riding their coattails, right? But my goal is just to make it simple and easy to understand. So it's not a question of stupidity, it's a question of ignorance. It's just, they were never taught to think about it that way. So I'm just training you to be a little bit more advanced in your thinking. And by the way, real world valuation is on cash flow. And that is cash flow, it's not margin. It's margin times productivity is actually cash flow. So it actually is a better predictor of what the stock price is going to be. So, continuing on. <clears throat> so hypothetical. So you have a company, this is just a purely made up company, that makes $100 million of no plat. And for our purposes, we're gonna use no plat and no pat interchangeably. I know in all the readings you've done in the book, McKinsey calls it no plat, but we're just gonna call it no pat. Now, I'm saying this semi-facetiously because I know most of you didn't read the book, but that's a hint, right? Because I'm assuming you've read the book and we're going from there, right? So just please read the book. But regardless, no plat stands for net operating profit less adjusted taxes. No pat is net operating profit after tax. It's your operating profit after tax. Excludes interest. So, 100 million of no pat. 50 million arbitrarily is given back to investors in the form of a dividend payout rate. 50 million is reinvested back into the firm. We'll call that the investment or reinvestment rate. Okay? That equals the 100 million dollars worth of profits. Any company that makes money actually has two choices about what to do with it. Do I put it back in? Do I reinvest? Or do I give it back to my investors? Do I pay it out? And those two ratios have to add up the investment rate and the payout rate to 100% of the profits. Therefore, one minus the reinvestment rate is the payout rate. One minus the payout rate is the investment rate. Those two together, 100% of the profits. We overly complicate it, but that's really it of what you're going to do with the money. You either put it back in or you pay it back. How you pay it back, different question, but those are your two fundamental choices. So let's assume this company does 50-50. New assumption, this company also makes a 10% ROIC. It's going to make 10% on its business historically, on investment, and 10% in the future, just to keep the math simple. So if this company were to reinvest $50 million of new investment and it makes 10% on that, its new profits on that investment are going to be $5 million. If the business made 10% before and nothing changes, its core is going to be $100 million. It'll make $5 million on the new investment. Next year, $105 million of profit, 5% growth rate. All right, that's just the mechanics of the way this plays out mathematically. Now, in finance, there's a shortcut. The shortcut for the growth in profit, also known as the sustainable growth rate, also known as G, but we're going to call G the rest of the semester, little g, which is the sustainable growth rate, equals the reinvestment rate times the ROIC. I reinvest 50% of my profits. I make 10% on that reinvestment. I therefore grow at 5% a year. Okay, That is the rate at which I can grow. To grow beyond that would require more money. Okay, that's why it's called the sustainable growth rate. It's the rate at which I can grow with internal funds. All right, let's test this out. So, you're talking to a CFO, and 
she, in this case, says, all right, here's my company, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the dividend from $50 million a year to $75 million a year, but we're going to maintain our growth rate. Now, here's the question. You're the financial analyst. You don't even know need to know the answer from the CFO to answer this question because you should already know the answer. <clears throat> Will this company need to borrow money, yes or no? So let me give you the stats so everybody thinks about this one more time. So I have, instead of $50 million of dividend, I pay $75 million in dividend. But I'm going to maintain my growth rate, 5%. Will this company need to borrow money, yes or no? Why is why are some of you nodding your head yes? Why yes? Somebody else? Why yes? All right, we'll go back to the default answer. Go ahead. Okay, that is a good answer. I'm pretty sure it's pretty correct. But just so you know, and this is a very another important point this semester, the TAs have been instructed to give him a zero on his assignment for that answer. He will get no credit. All right? And, and, and again, this is very important. This is not the squishy marketing, leadership, whatever crazy classes that you just cruise through without ever reading a textbook and can just make shit up and get A's. That's not finance. All right? You can't just say stuff. In this class, you must also give me numbers. Because otherwise, you could just make vague statements, and maybe you're right, but we have no idea if we really know that you're right. You're just making vague statements. I'm not saying his statements were vague. But the way that we're going to grade every assignment, starting with homework one and two, midterms, final exams, is you must tell us the numbers that support your statements. Because that's the only way we really know if you understand the concept. So let's go back to so his answer. So let's say it again with some numbers. So why do you know that they're going to borrow money? Okay. So you, if you have $100 million in profit yep. and you're increasing your dividend payout from $50 million to $75 million, mm -hmm. you only have $25 million that you're using in the investment. Great. So if you want to maintain the same um, growth, well... So you're, so, no, keep going with that. Yeah. So if you reinvest $25 million at what rate? At 10%, 10% are RYC. What's 10% of 25 that's the growth. That's the sustainable growth with the internal funds. Yet she is saying we're going to grow at five, but she only has the resources to grow at two and a half, therefore must borrow money. You see that, that, that first of all, it's a much better answer, so thank you, and thanks for letting me make that point. But that's what I want you to start to understand is that if you're a smart analyst, you really start to understand this stuff, there's a lot of information that's being out there that sometimes the companies themselves don't even realize they're telegraphing to you that you could actually start figuring out, All right? So let me give you another example. So let's just use the math that's on this page. Instead of a growth of 5%, I want to make this 10. So instead of a G of 5, I want to make it 10. How do I do that for this company that's on this page? Again, I'm going to start first. How do I get the G to 10? I'll give you a hint. There's two ways you're going to do that. You want to give me one of the two ways, or both ways. Go ahead. To what? That's right. So if the ROIC stays at 10%, the reinvestment rate goes to 100. 100 times 10 is 10%. But I'm telling you, in the real world, you know how many CFOs are going to want to slash the dividend? Probably close to zero. So what's our second alternative to get to 10%? Yes, sir. That's right. Make 20% in every project at 50% reinvestment. That gets you 10%. But snapping my fingers and doubling the return in every one of my businesses, that's not easy to do either. So I'm not saying it's easy to do, but that's what the math would tell us. So there's two ways to drive sustainable growth. Ability to fund growth internally. Number one, higher returns. Number two, less payout, more reinvestment. But that is actually a very important thing to understand. So take a company like Google, who I'm working with tomorrow, or Apple, or Microsoft, or Facebook, 
why do they have so much cash on their balance sheet? And to put this into perspective, I'll have to relog into Bloomberg. So I will eventually put this into perspective once I get back into Bloomberg. But why do these companies have so much cash on their balance sheet? Yeah. Well, they're doing one of the two, but the, the real key is they have extraordinarily high ROICs. So let me just ask you, just to, to test that, what is Apple's ROIC last year, approximately? What do you think? 20? 20 is low. Keep going. It's higher than 20. 40 is low. Higher. Keep going. Higher than 52. It's higher than 80. You guys got to really bump those numbers up. Higher than 200. Almost 300%. It's 285. So if you look up Apple, exactly, you know, now you know why they're doing so well. If you look at Apple, just as an example, and I look at their peers, there's a custom field in a future homework assignment that you're going to learn how to do that does what's called operating ROIC, which primarily excludes cash on hand, right? Because that's not really part of what they do. So when I look at their operating ROIC, which takes out non-operating items, 285% last year. By the way, I'll switch this to Google just because Apple's on Google's list. <clears throat> Close. <clears throat> Google 20%, Microsoft 32, Apple 285, Facebook 46, or 44. So here's the point. Sustainable growth basically means the rate at which you can grow with internal resources, right? So let's talk about Google. How much of a dividend does Google pay? Anybody know? Zero. And they don't really buy back stock either. So what's their payout rate? Zero. So what's their reinvestment rate? 100%. What's their ROIC? So what's 100% of 20? They can grow at 20% a year. Look at Facebook, which doesn't pay any dividends. They can grow at over 40% a year without basically needing external money. Apple can grow at 280% a year without needing to borrow external money, and Apple's growing at five. Even with the dividends and stock buybacks, <laughs> I was joking with the last class, so I was watching over the weekend. Uh, there's a movie called Blow with Johnny Depp. I just thought it was a good, good movie. And it's about the cocaine trade in the 70s, 80s. And the point is, they're making so much cash, they literally are carrying boxes of cash around the house. There's no place to put the cash. Like, that's Apple. Like, they make so much cash that they don't need to borrow money. They're actually trying to figure out what to do with all the cash they generate. To put that into perspective, if you look at FA, which is financial statements, Apple's cash, Google's cash is only $102 billion. Apple's cash last year was 270 billion, rounding off. And even after buying back $30 billion of stock a year and paying out $10 billion of dividend, they're still adding 20, 30 billion, $40 billion a year of cash to their balance sheet because they don't need to borrow money because they're generating such high returns, they're self-funded. That's the key irony point I want you to understand is that the high returning companies actually can grow faster because they make all those returns. It's the low returning companies that actually need even more money to make low returns. Do you remember the ROIC approximately of Tesla on Monday? We had the auto company list up. It was garbage, but what type of garbage are we talking about? Negative 12, 14 percent, something like that? So play that out. So if I have a negative ROIC, then to grow a dollar, I need to basically invest a dollar 12. I got to spend more in order to grow. Because the low ROIC actually needs cash. And that's the time when investors don't want to give it to you. 
Whereas everybody wants to give money to Mark Zuckerberg. Everybody wants to give money to, to Google and, fa and Facebook and Apple, but they don't need it. And so that's the point, is that the reason they don't need it is because they can have high sustainable growth rates. Does that make sense? So a couple of hands. You have a question? Did I see the chart before with the RIC chart? The RIC chart? Sure. What's the question going to be? I suppose it has like one. Uh, let's see, put Google back up. Well, there's two potential answers to your question. So one is, and, and this is the example of why, for example, Apple has such a high ROIC, is it's called Foxconn. Like Apple's actually convinced a Chinese company to hire a half a million employees to basically build the iPhone for all the investment, hold all the inventory, do all the facilities, and basically sell it to Apple for about $220. And then Apple sells it to you for eight hundred to a thousand, with almost no investment. Like that's the genius of Tim Cook, is that's the supply chain that he set up. The Chinese companies take all the risk, they have all the assets, and Apple makes all the profits. Okay. And by the way, if Apple doesn't sell twenty million iPhones that they thought they would, it's the Foxconn, the Chinese company, that eats all that inventory, right? Because they're the ones that Apple doesn't buy it until five days before they sell. It. Do you know why next week on September 11th or 12th, Apple's going to do their announcement for the iPhone, but you will not be able to order it that day. You will have a period of about a week to order it before the iPhone ship. You know why? Because what they're going to do is they're going to take your cash, and then they're going to tell Foxconn to start shipping them from Asia, and they don't pay Foxconn until they leave Asia. So they're going to hold your cash, they're going to pay Foxconn, and then, because you prepaid them, they're going to keep the difference, and they're going to make about $800 to $900 a phone after they pay Foxconn because they're raising the prices this year. That's the genius of Apple. We're more than happy to do that. That's how you make 280%. A lot of companies don't have that luxury. And who's the negative one on this list? Tencent. So Tencent gets a big negative return because one of two things happen. One, because their profit was negative, so they're making investments to grow. So they're not making profit. Or two, they actually can make profit on no investment. You can actually have a negative investment, right? So, for example, I have Netflix. Think about Netflix. Anybody here, Netflix subscriber? Yeah, yeah. When do you pay your credit card bill? Zero. When do you pay? So, for Netflix, when do you have to pay for Netflix? In advance. You're basically fronting them money. So, all of Netflix's growth is coming from the customers being funded by paying them 30 days in advance, like the bank. I don't need to go borrow money. You're giving it to me. So I'll use that to go drive all the content that I'm acquiring, and I don't have to borrow the money from the bank. This is what we're going to start getting into to understand real cash flow, but that's one of the reasons why Netflix is so valuable and why Netflix growth has been so exciting, because the more subscribers they're adding, subscribers actually come with cash in advance, and people like when they pick up a bunch of free cash. So again, more than we want to talk about today, but that's what I want to talk about with sustainable growth. In the interest of time, continuing on, free cash flow. So core concept is going to be free cash flow. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to define free cash flow very specifically. It's also defined in the book already. <clears throat> but I'll just give you a simple way to think about free cash flow. So I know not all of you have worked in real jobs yet, but let's assume you're working at a job and you get a pay stub. That net pay is, in free cash flow equivalents, what's called gross cash flow or cash from operations. So the cash coming in from the income statement is kind of like your pay stub. It's your net pay. And then what I, want, what I ask people to do is I say, imagine your monthly bills. That's your gross investment. And then just subtract. So if your monthly bills are greater than your net take-home pay, that's negative free cash flow. How do you survive? Yeah. Yeah, you can borrow money. You can raise your savings. Or if you have a mom and dad, call mom and dad. But basically, you need money. So that's the point. Part of what you're going to start realizing this semester is when I see a company that has negative free cash flow, I should immediately start thinking, where's that money coming from? I know they have to borrow. So that's the point of Tesla. This is why Wall Street gets really frustrated with Elon Musk. Right now, they have more accounts payable than cash on hand. They have $11 billion worth of debt. Several billion is due in the next couple of months. And they have negative profits for the rest of the year. And he says, I don't need to borrow any money. And I'm just saying, this is why the analysts get frustrated. Like, the math doesn't add up. And then he starts calling them names for challenging. I'm Elon Musk. I'm Mr. PayPal. Like, yeah, sure. But the math still says you're going to run out of cash. 
So I'm just saying that's one of the things you'll quickly start to understand is when you see negative free cash flow, and that's what Wall Street's looking at, where are you going to get the money? And as an aside, did anybody read the Wall Street Journal article on where they said he was actually going to get the funding for his taking private of Tesla? And then he decided to pull out? It, part of it was Saudi, but it was actually from somebody else that was more important. Volkswagen. Volkswagen was going to provide them almost $30 billion to go private. Because then they'd be a subsidiary, pretty much a Volkswagen. And Musk said, nah, I don't want to work with Volkswagen. So he pulled out of the deal. So it was interesting, because I was wondering, we were talking on Monday, like, where are they going to get the money and take them private? And the answer is an auto company. That was much more important than the Saudis, because it was the auto companies that saw the technology, and then Musk is like, eh, I don't really want to sell to an auto company, so no, I'm, I'm walking away from the deal. But Goldman and Morgan, and I forgot the other bank, that were basically arranging the work with auto companies, and they were going to be the big source of funding. So <clears throat> long story short, uh, just interesting article. You can find the Wall Street Journal. But uh, here's what matters coming out of free cash flow. So free cash flow, if you have positive free cash flow, then you can go spend money. ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. That's what I really want you to understand. And free cash flow equals the theoretical payout rate of a company because it's that cash that I can pay out. So those are two very important principles. So let's look at this slide, and I'll try and make it full screen. This slide, it illustrates a very important principle for the semester. Okay? All right, that's not going to work. I'll try and make it a little bigger through here. All right, you got two companies. These are completely made up, A and B, that both start with $100 million of profit. They both grow their profits 5% annually. So 100, 105, 110, that's expected to continue. They have the same risks, the same whack of 10%. So if I have two companies that both make identical profits, growing at identical uh, rates with identical risk, are these companies going to be valued the same? Or is one company more valuable than the other? Looking at the data on this slide. A or B? Same, different, and if different, who's more valuable? Go ahead. Um, I think it's going to be different. I think companies are going to be valued more because of their free cash flow. Yeah. So we just said that free cash flow is your theoretical payout, and free cash flow, therefore, is going to be the proxy for the value of the company. So higher free cash flow, higher value. B will be more valuable, All right? even for the same amount of profits. Now, I want to break down two important steps. Why does B generate more cash flow than A for the same profits? Over here. Yeah, so this, this investment is lower than that. That's mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't invest as much to make the same amount of profits. Now, let's assume they're not cutting quarters. They're actually better at what they do. But that's the point. The lower investment rate leads to higher free cash flows. Why, next level up, why does B need to reinvest less? What up here also helps inform that. Yeah. They have a higher ROIC. Exactly. I make a 20% ROIC, they make a 10% ROIC. Because I make a 20% ROIC, I don't have to invest as much to make the same free cash flow, or I'll make more free cash flow because I invest less. Better way of saying that. So we see that? Yes, sir. Is it a coincidence that the numbers are half or double each other? They're, they're half because the ROICs are 10 versus 20. So it's done specifically. But here's the real point of this slide. <clears throat> ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. This is the simplest way I can illustrate to you. If you have a higher ROIC, you will have more free cash flow. You will be more valuable. Caveat at the same level of growth. So at the same level of growth, if I make 20% and you make 10, I can invest half of what you do and make the same profit, or I can invest the same as you do, and then I'll have a higher growth in profits. Either way, I will generate more free cash flow. 
So what this example is set up to do is to illustrate that ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. McKinsey is an ROIC-based valuation company. The rest of the world, Enterprise DCF NPV. It's a lot harder to do an NPV than an ROIC. That's why people like McKinsey. It's the same math. It's just a simplified version. Now, the beauty for you is I know you don't like to do easy things. So later in the semester, we're going to spend three weeks building an enterprise DCF model, 10 to 15 tabs, 600 cells, lots of detail to value a company to get the free cash flows done right, methodically, Midigliani Miller, that you're going to be tested on. And then in 20 minutes, we're going to do a multiple space valuation model that syncs up with that. Okay, And that's the point, is they have to give us the same answers but the point is, the enterprise DCF is hard, multiples are easy, McKinsey's a multiple-based company, ROIC is a proxy. But here's the caveat, at the same level of growth. When growth is different, it becomes trickier, right? Because if I have a low ROIC, but I grow it really fast, that could actually be more valuable than a high ROIC that's not growing. Right. So this morning, my bleary eyed reading of the news on the way in, I basically saw an article that said Morgan Stanley has now set a price target for Amazon that will pass Apple as the most valuable company in the world, assuming that they're right. Now, Amazon does not have the free cash flow that Apple does. So to put this into perspective, Apple, with its 280% ROIC, here's free cash flow, is expected to generate free cash flow per year, 64 billion, 66 billion, 65 billion, 68 billion. That's free cash flow, by the way. That's pretty impressive. Everybody with me? The reason why it's not growing is because Apple's sales growth, put this into percentages, is expected to be, after this year's iPhones of 15%, then four and a half, three, and six. So they're really not growing any sales going forward. Everybody with me? Look at Amazon. Amazon is growing 30%, 22%, 20%, 18% per year. Then Amazon's free cash flow, which is dwarfed by Apple at only 18 billion this year, 26, 35, 44. When you run that out, right, when you get a lower ROIC at a much higher growth rate and you perpetuity that, you're going to get a much more valuable company than a company with a high ROIC that's growing at 3%. And that's what the, is gonna pass. And so what, if you play this out, both Amazon and Google, sometime in the next two years, will pass Apple as the most valuable companies on the planet, publicly traded, right? And it's not an indictment of Apple. It just goes back to Apple is struggling to find what's next and they're not growing, they're just mature. So if Apple pulls a rabbit out of the hat and finds the next big thing, this will change. But if Apple, the mature company, grows 3 to 5%, these other companies will pass them. So I'm just telling you, this is what makes it a little harder in the real world, but you'll start to understand that as we get to valuation. Questions? Okay, continuing on then. Time check. All right. So how do we actually value companies? Well, the difference between a company and a project is projects end and companies last forever, which means I got to project your cash flows forever. Well, introducing Mr. Perpetuity. So perpetual cash flow, cash flow forever, except that the cash flow grows, growing perpetuity. So the actual formula for a long-term value of equity is just a growing perpetuity. Cash flow divided by R minus G. Okay, And that's what this basically says, that we value a company using this as the magic formula. This is what you'll learn. But here's the nuance that McKinsey added to this formula. The problem in the real world with the academic teaching of this formula to everybody that's then used on Wall Street is built in this formula is the assumption that the internal rate of return on future projects 
equals the internal rate of return on historical projects. Translation, whatever return you make now, you make forever. Think about that. If we apply this formula to Apple, or sorry, to Google or Amazon, and right now Google and Amazon are in hyper growth mode, great return mode. They never slow down. They never mature. And what we will do mathematically is overvalue them using the math we learned at top business schools around the world. That the inherent bias is it exaggerates the current directionality. If we use this to value a cyclical business, Caterpillar, and they're at the bottom of an industrial cycle, then we will say that Caterpillar's done. They will never improve. It's a horrible stock price because it will just assume the bottom of the cycle perpetuates forever. So the challenge with the formula that you were taught that is used in the real world is it exaggerates forever the current level of performance. And it's just a limitation that I don't think even a lot of people know is built into the formula. So for better or for worse, this was McKinsey's attempt at the improvement in the book. Rearrange the math. Cash flow, free cash flow divided by R minus G. The R is the WAC. The cash flow is the free cash flow. Free cash flow is profit after reinvestment. Profit times one minus the reinvestment rate. Sustainable growth, G, is investment rate divide, times ROIC. Therefore, investment rate is G over ROIC. So the formula on the right, which is called the key value driver equation, which drives the four cornerstones, it's just a growing perpetuity. But why is this an improvement <coughs> over the same formula on the left by rearranging the map? What's being improved? What used to be on the left that's no longer here on the right? What's what's gone? Free cash flow. And instead of forecasting free cash flow, what's new that I'm forecasting instead of free cash flow? Profit, growth, and return. So what I can do with the key value driver formula is I can have a different ROIC and growth rate for the company going forward than it had historically. Now it's still one number for the entire future of the business but at least it can be more representative of the business going forward. So let me play out Apple. I don't think Apple's gonna make a 285% return in investment for a long period of time. It's gonna come down. The growing perpetuity formula doesn't let me adjust the 285% ROIC to something more reasonable. The key value driver formula does. And that's the improvement McKinsey tried to make. And that's the one we're gonna be using this semester. So earlier I asked you which company was going to be more valuable in the free cash flow, A or B, and intuitively you said that B would be more valuable because they generated more free cash flow, given the higher ROIC, less investment. So here's the deal. As financial analysts, let's value these two companies. So hint, this is going to be part of the homework assignment that's due next Wednesday. So you might want to follow along more carefully with what we're about to do. Okay, so this is... It's probably big enough to see. File, save as August, is it say 28th? 29th. 29th KVD video. Okay, so company A, company B. Four parts of the key value driver equation right here. So they are expected profit, expected growth, or G, the expected ROIC, and the WAC. And the reason I say is expected is because it's future cash flows. Therefore, future profit, future ROIC, future growth is more representative of future cash flows than historical ones. Okay, so Here's the deal. If we go back to the example in the PowerPoint, company A and B, let's actually value A and B using the data on the slide. Starting profits, $100, $100 million. 100, 100. Expected growth rates, 5% a year, expected to continue. G is a five. 
expected ROIC, 10, 20. We said that was going to continue. This is 10. This is 20. And the wax were 10% each. So I had asked you, value, which companies were more valuable, A or B, and you said B. Looking at the data, what's really different about B that makes it more valuable? That's the only thing that's different. So let's quantify. Putting this formula into this cell equals left paren profit times left paren 1 minus the expected growth divided by the expected ROIC, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, WAC minus G, right paren, billion dollars. And this company, billion five. So the math just says that B will be 50% more valuable, even though intuitively we knew it was going to be more valuable. I just want to quantify that. Now, there's something called a multiple. For example, a price-to-earnings multiple. As an example, PE. What would the price-to-earnings multiple of business A be in the real world? What would its PE trade at? 10. This is its price. This is its earnings. And company B would trade at a multiple of 15. So that's the other thing. Multiples are based on cash flow valuation. It's just rearranged math. So ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. Multiples are a proxy for free cash flow valuation. That's an important insight. It's not something alternative. It's just a way of rearranging the math. Yes, sir? ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. Multiples are a proxy for free cash flow valuation. That's what I mean. I do a DCF, I do a multiple, I should get the same answer. It's just the shortcut. Okay. And it is based on re rearranged math. Hence, key value drivers, these are the four things that drive value and multiples for a business. This is what the math tells us. And if we understand this, we'll understand not only stock prices, but why they're changing. So. A little, little scenario planning here. What if business A were to double its profits overnight? Wins a lottery. Big win, makes twice as much money. But nothing long-term changes about the business. So long-term is still going to make 10% return, still going to grow 5% a year, same risk, but they just get one big win. What happens to the value of business A when the profits double? And what happens to its PE multiple? Before I actually type, hit enter, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the value? Up, down, stay the same. Up. What's going to happen to the multiple? Up, down, stay the same. All right, I heard a up, I heard a down, I heard a stay the same. We're going to have fun in the midterm exam. So, here we go. That's double. That's triple. This, and by the way, here's company B, double, triple, quadruple. So in this case, the value goes up, multiple does not change for either company. This is called sizing, principle and finance. I am more valuable just because I, I am bigger and I make more absolute amount of cash. So that just illustrates one way to become more valuable. Just go make more cash, more MPV, okay? So that's one way to be more valuable, be bigger. But that doesn't make you better. What makes you better? What makes me want to pay more for the same earnings? What drives the multiple? It's not how much profit you make. Therefore, growth, ROIC, WAC, growth, spread. Value drivers, cornerstones. This determines your multiple. So let's reset. What if... You are Walmart, and you go to Mexico, and Target, who makes more money, says, nah, we're not going to go to Mexico, we're just going to stay in the U.S. So I have the lower price business model, Walmart's not going to suddenly change its model in Mexico, 
So I'm still going to make the lower return. But now my profits long term are going to grow at 6% a year versus 5% a year because I just have new markets that you chose not to get into. Now, 100 growing at 6% into perpetuity versus 105% growing into perpetuity. What happens to the value of A? What happens to the multiple of A? What happens to the value? Up, down, stay the same. Should go up. What happens to the multiple? All right, let's see how much this increases. 6% per year forever. Look at row 7 and 9. 7% per year. 8% per year. 9% per year. Now, full disclaimer, I am operating on no sleep for 36 hours. All right? So it is entirely possible, and not just because of lack of sleep, I will make mistakes throughout the semester. I will be first to admit it. So here's the question. Did I screw up in my sleep to five to pry? I can't even talk. Did I screw this one up? Or is this the way it's supposed to be? It might be the way it's supposed to be, and it might be I screwed it up. Let's see. Pressure's on. Hope I didn't screw it up. Six percent. Seven percent. 8%, 9%. It exactly is the right answer. That's exactly why this is not changing. What is the NPV of company A on the new projects? What are they borrowing at? What are they making? NPV? Zero. So that's the point. You're exactly right. There's no value being added because they're just equaling their cost of capital. I like to call this the treadmill. You run really fast, you don't go anywhere, and eventually you get tired. Can't tell you how many companies that I work with that are on the treadmill. And they're frustrated because they're like, but we're growing. We're doing all these sales. We're working hard. We're getting more profits. Yet our stock price isn't going anywhere. Wall Street must be just not understanding us. And I was like, no, what you're missing is look at all that investment you made to generate those sales and profits and the low returns that you're getting on that. And you're basically on the treadmill because you're not really generating any value. That happens a lot. We need to understand that. Yes, sir. Can you explain why there's multiple stuff going up? Because it's NPV zero. There's no impact on the valuation. So what's happening is that it just, it's like running in place. That's what I'm saying. It's just you're running in place. So the value doesn't change relative to the profit. So watch the profit. Sizing, I'm a bigger company. 200 to profit, 2 billion of revenue. But the ratio to 200 to 2,000 stays the same. Sizing, I'm a bigger company. 300 of profit, 3 billion of value. But I'm not better at what I do because I'm not creating any more value for the projects. I'm just doing more projects. Ever see that? Exactly. That's the point. This is what we mean by spread. Spread is everything when it comes to value. So let's go back. Why is the multiple getting so high with business B? Because I'm borrowing a 10, I'm making 20, and I'm just throwing gasoline on that fire as I grow and I become exponentially more valuable. So let me just ask you just generically. You got a startup with a PE of 50, you got another company with a PE of 10. Just conceptually. You bias here. What's going on between the company with 50 and the company at 10 PE? What drives PE? Growth, return, risk. So why would a company have a PE five times another company? There's a lot more expected growth. There's a lot more expected return. All right. So let's translate this out in the real world. So I, I said this harshly, so I'm going to say as harshly as I, I will today. If you want to watch a bunch of stupid rich people talking, CNBC tonight. Because they're going to say really dumb things, but they people are going to be like thinking they're really smart. I'm not talking about Jim Cramer. I'm talking about the people before or after him. Because here's what they're going to say. And you'll actually see them say this. And until you heard what I'm about to tell you, you would have actually thought that they were smart too. So this is advanced. And most finance majors don't even understand the mistakes that they make. 
So I'm going to show you a very common mistake that people make. So let's go back to Google as an example. And let's look at the competitors. And what I want to look at is the PEs. So custom, one of the templates you're going to build later this semester, gives you what's called forward PEs. And it's, it's going to be called FY2. So this is the, this column right here, PE2FY, or 2F, 2YF, either way. So what it means is second forward year. In this case, 2019. First year 2018, second year 2019. The reason why second forward year matters is because we're halfway through 2018. So I kind of want like the next forecasted clean year, second forward year. That's just pretty much we standardize and we get more normalized results around it. And I care more about that than your historical PE because I get your future cash flows, which is more representative of your business. So here's the thing. Google's PE based on 2019 earnings is around 22. The market PE is 21. Apple's PE is 16 and a half. So here's going to be the statement. Buy Apple because Apple's on sale. You're getting a bargain. Apple should be trading like the industry at a 20 PE. And then you, you can buy Apple at 16. So you got some immediate upside buying Apple. It's a steal. What's the flaw in that logic? Who has the higher ROIC? Yeah, and Google has a low ROIC. So it's not about the high ROIC. Once you get to high ROICs, you're going to play around with the key value drivers. What you're going to realize is the real challenge. And I'll go back here. I'll show it to you. Watch this. I'll go back down to 3% as an example. And watch this. PE, 20, 30, 40, 50. Watch this. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Once you start getting high ROIC, if you don't grow, you're not accelerating and your PE stays low. So, prescient, what is Apple's challenge? Apple EEO, Earnings Estimate Overview, Growth Rate, <clears throat> Apple's Revenue Growth, we use that as a proxy, after this year's iPhones of 15%, then 4 and a half, 3, and 6. Google, Twenty-three, twenty, thirteen, nineteen. If Apple doesn't grow high teens to low double digits to 19, 20%, they're never going to have the same PE as Google. It, the math will never work out regardless of what their, what their cash flow is from ROIC. And that's what people miss, is that it's the growth return combination. Apple is not growing as fast as its peers just because it's a $200 billion company. They don't have what's next. They're mature while large numbers plays a role in this. So that's the point. They're never going to trade at a PE of 20. Matter of fact, what's more likely is what's going to happen to Google as Google gets bigger and more mature. That their PE is going to more look more like Apple. That's the naive statement. So the naive statement is you're not going to see this industry of the PE of 20. You're going to see this industry of the PE closer to 15 or 16. That's what's probably going to happen, and you're going to miss pricing. Right? And by the way, you want to see this in real time? Look at Google's <coughs> PE, 31, 26, 22. Those are the forward PEs based on current stock prices. That's the point. You look at the data, the PEs actually contract because people know that they're going to have to reprice as they grow slower at a lower PE. So let me point it out a different way. This is why people make mistakes as an analyst. How many analysts mistake? What's Google's PE today? 31. Google grows a dollar a share of earnings, therefore their stock price goes up $31. Year two, Google grows another dollar. 
31. 31 more dollars. Two dollars of EPS, sixty-two dollars. I'm just gonna keep it simple. Of stock price. Two years later, is that what happened? No, because the PE is 26. It only went up 56. What the hell just happened? I thought it was gonna go up, but I didn't recognize that the PE is actually gonna go down as the time moves on, and I'm gonna overprice my target because I'm using today's PE. And I'm just gonna be advanced. You want to work for banks? First thing they tell you in the banks. Use the current PE. How'd you get out of your previous finance classes? You took final exams that probably made you use an industry average PE. Everybody trades at the average. Well, you trade at the average if you have average growth and average return. If you don't have average growth and average return, you don't have an average multiple. And this is what I mean by advanced in this class that I really want you to understand. There's a lot of undergrads that don't understand this, and this is a big differentiator, even when you talk to some of the banks. But by the way, don't tell a partner at a firm that they don't know what they're doing. Okay, they'll fire you. All right, politics trumps knowledge at Wall Street. Just remember that. All right, so back to this. <clears throat> Those are two scenarios. You understand these two scenarios? There's two more. You have a lot of idea what's going on with stock prices. Scenario number three. You are Coke, and you have a sugar problem. The world has decided that sugar is bad. So they're buying less soda. So let's go back here. Let's look at Coke, KO, U.S. equity. Revenue for Coke this year is going to be $32 billion. Last year was $35 billion. Coke is shrinking. So what Coke has actually said is, because people aren't buying as much soda until we figure out the alternative, we're cutting marketing by a billion dollars. We're going to lay off a bunch of people. So we're going to protect our margins, protect your returns, investors, because we're going to slash spending to be more appropriate with the sales that we have until we figure out what's next. By the way, what is next that Coke is investing in today that puts them back on a growth trajectory? What's the big experiment? It's not water. It's alcohol. Where? It's alcohol. Where? Uh, Asia, right mm -hmm. Specifically, it's in Tokyo. Has anybody from or been to Tokyo and had Coke alcoholic drinks? They've been out for about six months. They're testing them in Tokyo right now. And it's basically fruit-flavored alcoholic infused drinks. So just imagine like a Fanta grape with tequila in it. <clears throat> so, so I don't know if those are exact flavors, but that's you can look up on the web. They have YouTube videos for this. And by the way, this is actually for Coke a huge shift. That's not Coke's core values for the last hundred years. They're like mom, apple pie, Coke. This would be like Disney getting into the porn business as a way to grow. Like that's just not Coke's history of what they do. But nonetheless. People aren't buying sugar. they got to figure something out. So, hey, booze it on up. All right, so back to this. <clears throat> Coke's going to eventually grow. But even when they grow, they're probably not going to grow as well as they used to because so, they're still going to have a sugar problem. And eventually people are going to say alcohol is going to be a problem too. So let's go back here. What happens when they grow at 3%? Well, the value and the multiple go down. This is called multiple contraction. This is cornerstone number three, expectation. I price you as if. I price you as if you're making 20%, you're growing that 5% a year. I realize I was too optimistic. You're making 20%, you're only gonna grow 3% a year. That is worth less. In fact, here's the multiple contraction. This is Google. 7% growth becomes 6% growth, becomes 5% growth, becomes 4% growth. That's what happens to PEs over time. Final one, I have a negative spread. My ROIC is less than my cost of capital. What happens when I grow? Six, seven. This is bad growth. Avoid these companies. So what do I do? Four, two, Zero, negative three. Key value drivers. You understand this. You understand almost everything we need to know the rest of the semester. And by the way, here's your hints in the Bloomberg Trading Challenge. Read a piece of news. Ask yourself three questions. How does this change the revenue expectations? Growth. How does this change the return expectations? How does this change the risk? then you know directly what's going to happen to the stock price, right? 
There's a lot of information in plain sight people don't even realize it's being communicated. So when you read the articles, start putting in that context, you're going to get a lot smarter about what's going to happen to companies. You can take advantage of that when the expectations change. That's what's going to drive price. That's what the trading challenge is actually forcing you to start to look at. Yes? How can make this growth positively affect the company? Well, <clears throat> hey, doctor, my head hurts. Why is your head hurt, Mr. Perfetti? Well, I've been banging my head against the wall at night. Well, stop banging your head against the wall. All right, so that analogy didn't work on you. So, <clears throat> so here's the point. Every time I sell something, I lose 10 cents. Okay. So if I sell something else, I lose another 10 cents. So one way to not lose 10 cents, don't sell in the first place. That's what we might do growth. Just don't do it. Disinvest. Sell it off. Shut it down. Do something, but don't keep ramping up that lost sales. Now, I'm not saying that Tesla isn't ramping up lost sales now, but there has to be an expectation that will eventually turn into a positive spread. If they keep selling cars at a loss and people don't think that they're actually going to flip that script, that's when it becomes due. Right? Yes. Does, for the multiple, profit doesn't affect the multiple. So, and you're 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 tearing, you're tugging at a very important chord that I don't want to get into yet, but we're assuming in this entire conversation that productivity is not changing. Later, as we get more sophisticated, your question becomes very relevant because the rate of return in investment and the rate of change in profit can start to differentiate if your productivity becomes not constant. So for simplicity, good point, I am making productivity constant. Right? But I still wanted to illustrate the general principles as we get started. We will get more advanced. So it's a good insight that you just brought up. Right? In the interest of time, real, real quick, go ahead. Yeah, so ROIC and growth, these are all related to a company's operations, right? Not this is operating ROIC, operating cash flows. We're separating out non-operating activities for the time being. We'll value that separately. I don't invest in Coke because Coke has a bunch of cash in its bank. I invest in Coke because I think they're going to sell more products. So it's operating that we're focused on. All right, in the interest of time, this is going to be your homework. And it's helping me because I'm going to talk to Google tomorrow. So <clears throat> let's look at Google. And for key value drivers, we're going to look at actual P-E ratio. All right, P-E stands for price to earnings. It's based on earnings per share, net income, the accounting world. So instead of expected profit, it's actually expected net income. And instead of growth in profit, which was no plat, operating profit, it's going to be growth in the net income. That's what a PE is actually based on. Instead of ROIC, which is the return on debt and equity, net income, which is only equity, it's return on equity, just the equity investment that drives the net income. So this becomes expected return on equity. And finally, I don't discount at a whack cost of debt and equity, if I'm just discounting an equity cash flow, I just discount on my cost of equity. So that is what becomes different. Same key driver, key value drivers formula, but when we do an actual PE, this is what we look at. Does that make sense? Now, to do your assignment, it won't be Google, I'll give you a couple of other companies, but you're going to follow a very similar process. So for FY2, forward year two, I need the data to do this analogy for Google. So for Google, go to Bloomberg, what you do is once you've logged in, you type the company's ticker symbol or name, <clears throat> and you go to the company. Once you're at the company, EEO, Earnings Estimate Overview. That's where you're going to get your data because that's the forward expectations. Make sure you're using annual, not quarterly data. Otherwise, it'll completely screw things up. Now, if you want to take a screenshot, so I'll take one. Take screenshot. Save it. You can take screenshots if you want to bring it outside of this room or whatever lab you're in. If you want to bring it home to do the work, just get the data real quick. So I'll just do my screenshot. I'll call this Goog-EEO. Okay, so sitting here on the screen, forward year two, these red, actual, last year, forward year one, forward year two. You just count the columns, okay, because fiscal years might be slightly off. 
So for them, this is their forward year two. Now, what do we need? First, I need what's called net income adjusted. This is my forecasted net income. It's adjusted to take out non-cash accounting items or one-time charges. So Bloomberg has net income, which is GAAP, and then they have adjusted net income. The PE that matters is based on the adjusted net income. So for Google, 2019, right now, 41,366. Okay, we're gonna solve for the long-term growth rate. Expected return in equity. Right here is the return in equity for the next three years that the analysts are forecasting. 17 and a half, 17%, 16 and a half, 15.6. Ideally, take these three numbers, divide by three. That'd be the three-year average, all right? But in the interest of time, I'm just gonna eyeball it. 17, 16 and a half, 15 and a half, I'm gonna call this 16 and a half. Okay, <clears throat> I'll be directionally correct. You must be actually correct, but interest of time. Finally, I need a cost of equity. Cost of equity is going to be on the WAC screen, W-A-C-C, -C, once you go to a company. <clears throat> this is the WAC, but I want the cost of equity, not the cost of debt and equity combined. Now, it just so happens that Google doesn't have any debt, so basically the cost of equity is the cost of debt, or the cost of capital, so 11.9%. So here's the deal. If I take this forward, this is the model PE, and this is the observed PE today. So right now, Google's observed PE, and it's back on the EEO screen, for forward year two, 2019, is 26.06. That's the trading PE of Google right now, current stock price based on 2019 earnings estimates, 2606. I want to know what growth rate gets these two to equal each other. So what we're doing is we're using the model to basically estimate the growth that the market must be using for Google in order to justify the stock price. Hence why I said you're helping me out for tomorrow as well, because I want to kind of go in and tell Google, hey, Google, this is what the market actually thinks you're going to grow over the next few years, right? We can know that by using the analytics here because we know the data point that we need to solve for. We just back into it based on the other data points we see in Bloomberg. So what makes the growth get these two numbers the same? Pick a number, 5%. It's going to be higher than 5. Add a percent, a couple decimal places. So eight, we can do a solver function, nine, 11, so not 11, 10 10.5, 10 10.51, I'm pretty close, okay? So somewhere around 10.5% is what the market expects Google's long-term G to be. And that's growth in net income, EPS, not growth in free cash flow which would have been based on the original formula. But that's what the math tells us. Does everybody see what I just did? Any questions on replicating this? Because this will be one of your homework assignments. Yes? What's the formula in the model cell? So the formula in the model cell is basically the same one we just carried over. And the only reason why it's different is because the inputs I'm using are all equity-based. So here, expected profit on the left is no plat or no cap. That's basically operating income. This is net income. Growth in operating income, or free cash flow. Growth in net income. Expected ROIC, return on debt and equity. This is just return on equity. WAC, cost of debt and equity. This is just cost of equity, straight. All right? I'm leaving the formula up here because, I don't know if you can see it, this is being recorded on YouTube. So in just a second, I'm gonna publish this to YouTube. So you're able to see what I did in recreating what you did, including what can, you can pause it. You can also use this formula. So what you're going to get is you're going to get a couple companies. You're going to have to go into Bloomberg, and you're going to have to solve for their Gs after putting together the spreadsheet using observed data. Between, and it, you, it's a little bit of a range, because obviously, depending on when you do it, the, the prices could change. But your G should be relatively close by Wednesday. Mm -hmm. That's one of the two homework assignments. There'll be two. Yes. So we're replicating like a home that's going to be called B, called B, basically? You need this formula 
You need to get these two to match, and you need to basically solve for that that gets these two pretty close. I mean, if you're like a couple of one hundredths of a decimal place off, I'm not going to call that not matching. But you're going to get a G approximately like this. So if you came in with your assignment, your G was 9%, we're going to say that's wrong. Okay, you're not going to get 9%. You might get 10.48, 10.53, but you're not going to get 9 if you do the math right. That's what I said. Common mistakes, make sure you do not do quarterly data. Because you can actually accidentally look at quarterly data, and that'll screw things up because everything's going to be multiplied by 4. And you're getting a really wacky PE, so you're going to have to really change the growth to make this work. So, again, this has been on video. This is recorded. This is one of the two assignments. The other one will be straightforward based on what we've already done. No class on Monday. All right, happy Labor Day. Be safe. Class on Wednesday. 10 a.m. is the deadline for all sections. Make sure you submit both assignments individually before 10 a.m. And <clears throat> three things. We're going to go over these assignments. We're going to break you into teams. And we're going to introduce the Bloomberg Trading Challenge. That will be Wednesday's class. Yes, sir. Are we going to format our Bloomberg uh, like this so we can go through it? I just took two screenshots. You'll actually see the screenshots for Google. Okay. So you'll know the screens to go to. And again, it's on the video. Okay? See everybody on Wednesday. Have a safe and happy weekend. Do you have the textbook? That's on mine, right? Uh, hold on.